Would you open your Bibles, please, and turn with me to Acts chapter 12? We have a tradition in our family, at our house, that each evening before the evening meal, the person in our family who is the most thankful for the blessings of the day offers the prayer at dinner. And um, I'm here to tell you tonight that I have deemed myself as the most thankful to be here tonight. So I would like to offer the Lord's blessing on our time together now as we study his word. So let's pray together. Father, we are thankful. We are glad. We rejoice that we can come into this sanctuary and we can sit down and in our hearts we're kneeling down before you because we recognize who it is that we worship, the true and living God. You are the one who has your way in our lives, Lord. And as we invite you tonight to do just that, to have your way, would you speak to us uniquely and individually as only you can by your Holy Spirit. And this we ask in Jesus' name, amen. It is so good. I truly mean that, to be here with everybody tonight. It's been, um, this is my first opportunity to teach this year, merely because I've been very busy behind the scenes with a lot of other things, so uh, it is a special blessing for me. And I particularly enjoyed this lesson this week, this chapter in Acts. I feel like it truly is an unfolding drama. Every week there are twists and turns and new happenings and new lessons for us. But Tuesday evening, I was sitting in my living room and I was listening to President Barack Obama deliver his annual State of the Union address, that yearly message when he shares with everyone what's good with our country and what's not so good and the condition on the world globe and what his plans are to deal with the not so good. And I had a, a thought as I was sitting there watching him. I wonder if someone could get up and share a message on the state of the church in today's world. What would that look like? How would today's church stack up with the church of the first century that we see in the book of Acts? Um, how would our way of dealing with today's issues compare with what those early first believers did? Because there are a lot of similarities. In the days of Acts, the world was in peril. Today, the world is in peril, isn't it? Persecution is alive and well, just like it was then, only today it's on a much bigger scale. Wars are being fought, and we have, because of technology, the addition of what we refer to as cyber terrorism, which amounts to, in our daily lives, our laptop literally becoming the battleground at times for hackers around the world that want to disrupt our daily lives. Statistics, interestingly, show that poverty in the world is actually going down. It's not as bad as it's been in decades before, but affluence certainly is still the pursuit on everyone's mind. Make as much of this life as you can, and yet, at the same time, people aren't satisfied. More than half the marriages today don't make it, and that includes those in the church. Crime is up. Abortion is on the rise. I found out yesterday when I went to look at some statistics that there is actually an abortionclock.org. I don't know if you are aware of that, but it came up on my computer, and as I sat there looking at it, it was live. It was active, and it was clicking off the numbers. And I found out that in the first 21 days of the month of January, that so far this year, there have been 2,262,197 abortions as of yesterday morning. And I was looking at those numbers and they were really kind of staggering and it, and it just 
drew me in for a minute because I realized every one of those represents a life that is no longer here. And then there was one that said, since 1980, they have been tracking all of these numbers. And since 1980, the number of abortions that have happened worldwide are, now imagine this, they are 10 digits to the left of the decimal point, 10. I actually had to look that up because I didn't know what that was. It's a quadrillion. It's so many. It's more than we can fathom in our minds. But when you look at the world situation today, it looks pretty bleak, just like it did back in the first century. But how is the church today dealing with these issues? What are we doing? Our mission is still to take the gospel out to every part of the world and evangelize. And at Harvest Christian Fellowship, that is our mission. We are fulfilling that mission. That's our call, and we're actively in pursuit about it. But as a church body, and we as individuals, how are we dealing with the global and even the local situation? Because the only way we can deal with it is to do it the way the believers back in the first century did it, and that's through prayer. Some of you will remember that back in September, we held a prayer rally for Pastor Saeed Abedini, who is in prison for three years now for sharing the gospel. And for three years, he has been just horribly tortured. His life has been threatened many times. His health is very frail. There have been times when they didn't know whether he would make it or not. But we mobilized as a church, and we met downtown, and we prayed together, and we lifted him up, and we implored the Lord for his release. And that should be the norm, not the exception. That should be repeated often. We should be accustomed to it, to utilize the power that is available to us, because the church is only as strong as the believers in it are doing the business of God. Do you believe that? It's true. The church is only as strong as the believers in it are doing the business of God. Now, if I bring that down a little bit and personalize it closer to home, what do I do when I have a crisis situation and I seem to be helpless to my circumstances? I do the same thing that you do. I pull together a handful of people, my sisters in Christ, that I know will be faithful to lift me and my circumstances to the Lord. And I'm comforted and I'm encouraged in knowing that they are praying. But whether we're talking about the world situation or our personal circumstances, we have the one indispensable weapon at our disposal that the early church had, and that's prayer. And if we do not use that weapon, we are in peril of losing, not our salvation, we're in peril of losing our influence, our impact in this world, the, world, the ability to make a difference. Because it is not that God won't answer and do something. It is more often a matter that we don't ask him to do something. And it isn't that God doesn't care. It's that either we don't care enough to ask him or we simply don't know how or we don't know what to ask him. Because if you and I really understood what it is that we have available, through the avenue of prayer, what we are capable of, we would indeed be turning our world upside down just like they did. Spiritual warfare is still very much alive and well. Always was, always will be until the Lord returns. But that early church understood the words of 2 Corinthians 10, 3 and 4. 
Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war in the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. That's what we see in our chapter this week in the book of Acts. Look at chapter 12. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched out his hand to harass some from the church. Then he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to seize Peter also. Now it was during the days of unleavened bread. So when he had arrested him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four squads of soldiers to keep him, intending to bring him before the people after Passover. And Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. It is now 11 years after Pentecost, after the Holy Spirit came. And here we come not to the first test because there had been others, but this is the first crucial test of the power of prayer experienced by the united body of this young church. And it is a most wonderful drama that is played out from four different perspectives, four scenes of action, and viewed from four different dwellings. And that's how I would like to look at it with you tonight. We see the palace. We see a prison, we see a private home, and then we see at the end heaven's perfect dwelling. In verse 1 of chapter 12, it says, about that time. Now, what time is this referring to? Well, the church had been on very much of a winning streak, if you will, for a while. There had been one exciting conversion after another. There was Saul of Tarsus. There was Cornelius the Gentile centurion. Then there was the mixed crowd of Jews and Gentiles in Antioch, where the disciples were first called Christians. And then there was the rounding together of a benevolent offering for a future famine that was prophesied about. They were active in giving. There was a lot going on. But in Acts 12, because of all those good things, that brutal opposition by Satan once again rears its ugly head. And in the first scene, we find Herod in the palace. And we stop and we look and we say, what is going on? What is happening in this palace with Herod? All comes down to one word, persecution. That's what he was about at this time. Herod stretched out his hand to harass some from the church. And that word harass means to mistreat or injure or exasperate or harm or vex. Now we know a little bit about this king, that Herod Agrippa came from a very wicked family of rulers that his uncle Herod Antipas was the one who played a role in the trial of Jesus. But in addition to that, Agrippa's grandfather was Herod the Great, the one that we read about in Matthew 2, who re received a visit from the wise men who were seeking Jesus, who told him, we've seen his star in the east and we've come to worship him. And Herod, in a paraphrase, said, well, I haven't heard of him. Go and find him and come and report back to me when you do. And of course, the wise men didn't. They were forewarned to go in another direction. So Herod became alarmed by the news of another newborn king in the region. And you know the story. He consequently ordered the slaughter of every innocent male child under the age of two years in Bethlehem and throughout the surrounding region. But Herod the Great also had Agrippa's father murdered, at which time Agrippa's mother sent him to Rome to get out of his grandfather's way. So Herod Agrippa grew up in the Roman culture, very wealthy culture, alongside of other royals, if you will, in nearby regions. 
And eventually, one of those other royals, his friend Emperor Caligula, pronounced Herod Agrippa as king, giving him the regions that were formerly ruled by his uncle. Nice family lineage, right? It's not exactly who you want in your family tree. But if you fast forward to their present day, here in chapter 12, Herod had James killed to appease the Jews. And you remember that James was one of the three in the Lord's inner circle, the other two being his brother John and then Peter. We know, as we studied Stephen, that James was not the first one to die for his faith. Stephen was. But James was the first apostle to suffer martyrdom. And it happened sometime between that prophecy by Agabus of the famine at the end of chapter 11 and the arrival of Barnabas and Saul in Jerusalem. But the death of James did two things. It first of all shattered the illusion that the 12 apostles enjoyed somehow a kind of divine protection that no one else did because they didn't. They were as dependent upon the Lord as everyone else. And secondly, it tested the power of prayer by this believing church. And because killing James pleased the Jews, Herod Agrippa set his sights to go after an even bigger prize, that of Peter, because he was the leader. And he put him in prison with every intention of killing him after the week-long celebration of Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and now at this time, Easter as well. And it's interesting to note that this is not just a commentary on Herod Agrippa, whose approval ratings went up through all of this persecution. It also speaks to the condition of the Jews at this time because they hated the Christians. And they especially hated Peter at this particular point in time because Peter had taken center stage. And Peter didn't just stretch the boundaries. He obliterated the boundaries. Peter had repeatedly defied the Sanhedrin who commanded him not to preach about Christ. And he had not only fellowshiped with Gentiles, he had accepted them. He had embraced them in the Christian faith without honoring the traditions of the Jewish rites of circumcision and the requirement that they become Jews first. So they didn't like Peter. And ironically, their Jewish celebration of the Feast of Unleavened Bread required that every Jewish household be rid of their leaven, their yeast, that they used to make their staple of bread because leaven to them symbolized sin and corruption. So they got rid of it. They did an outward thorough cleaning of all of it. But think about this. They had to scour their homes to rid themselves of sin in accordance with their law, outwardly cleaning up, while inwardly their hearts were fermenting with the hidden leaven of murder and wickedness. And God looks on the heart. He sees what's going on. Then we come to scene two, and that's Peter's prison. So we stop and ask the question again, okay, what do we see going on in Peter's prison? And you can bring it all down to one word, peace. Peace. Not what you'd expect in a prison setting. What kind of week must Peter have endured? He knew that his close friend James was dead. He knew that he was next. He was counting down the days. He was kept in a maximum security prison, chained next to two guards. Picture that in your mind 
how difficult that would be. Two more guards standing at the door, two gate wards further down the way, and then a large iron gate at the end of it all. And yet, in verse 5, we see that word, but. It just almost leaps off the page at us. But it appears right in the middle of everything. You know, the buts of the Bible are worth looking at. They're worth paying close attention to because they usually announce that a really big change is about to take place. Those iron gates of the prison doors were heard loudly clanging shut, but the gates of heaven were swinging wide open because, Luke says, prayer was made without ceasing. And despite Peter's wretched circumstances, and surely it must have been very dismal, what do we see Peter doing? Verse 6, he was sleeping. And we're so used to our comfy soft beds and our pillows. Never mind the hardness of the floor or the darkness of the cell or the minutes that were ticking by in Peter's head. He wasn't, he wasn't bothered by any of that. But it must have been very uncomfortable for him. And yet, he wasn't just sleeping. He was sleeping soundly, like a baby would. He didn't need a Xanax. Didn't have to take a tranquilizer. He was out cold completely trusting in God. And it's interesting to stop and ponder. I wonder if Peter remembered the words that Jesus spoke to him on that seashore at the end of John 21 when he talked about the future end of Peter's life. And Jesus said to him, when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you. Peter's hands were stretched out, and another was girding him, but he was not yet an old man. So he really had nothing to fear if he remembered that promise of Jesus. It certainly seems to apply here. And perhaps he also thought about the other two times that he'd been imprisoned and subsequently released. He would later write in his own epistles in 1 Peter 5, 7, to the believers, cast all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Peter knew that verse not just mentally, but experientially because he had lived it out, and he wanted other believers to know it. He was so much at peace in his relationship with God that even an angel filling his cell with light could not wake him up. Now, I think I would notice that. I'm a light sleeper, but I, I'm pretty sure that if an angel's light flooded my bedroom, I would know it, and Peter didn't know it. I am one of those people who happen to believe in angels. I don't know if you do, but the Bible is full of examples of their appearances. And if you want to do an interesting study sometime, do it on the appearances of angels. But if you're a doubter, I'll give you one verse tonight. Hebrews 1.14 says that angels are ministering spirits sent forth to minister to those who will inherit salvation. Now, you know who that's talking about? You and me. We are the inheritors of salvation. I believe in angels, and I believe that I had a personal encounter with one 35 years ago, but it still comes back to my mind very readily. As I laid in a hospital bed, uncertain as to whether or not I would live or die, there came a moment when I realized that. And I surrendered my life to Jesus Christ, and I told him, to either just take my life and end it or to use me somehow in some way that would glorify him. 
And the day after I prayed that prayer, I began to get a visitor in my room each day. My husband could not be with me constantly, and I was so ill. He had to work. We had a two-year-old son at the time. The hospital was located an hour away from our home. I had no family or friends that could come and visit me. We weren't yet believers that belonged to a body of Christians. I didn't have the fellowship, so I didn't appreciate what that meant. But every day, a kindly gentleman would come to visit me, always when I was alone. He seemed to know when that was, and always when I was at my worst. When things didn't seem like they could get any darker or more dismal or more painful, he would show up, and I would hear his footsteps coming down that hospital corridor, shuffling as he walked down the hall. I didn't know him by name, and neither did anyone else. I didn't know where he came from or how he found out about me. Somehow it just didn't seem important in that moment. But no one else knew who he was. And when he sat beside my bedside, he sat just enough at an angle that I didn't look into his face very often. But when I would glance over, I would see that one of his hands was sitting atop his cane and the other was holding my hands. And I don't remember hearing his voice, but I remember being very aware that he would pray for me. And when he prayed, I was comforted, always. For five days, he came every single day at just the right moment. And on the day, that I began to get better and my vital signs changed and it looked like I was heading forward and improving, I never saw him again. I never heard from him. I don't know what happened to him. And I concluded early on that in my limited knowledge of what it meant to be a believer that I perhaps had a visit from an angel. Those impressions stayed with me for a very long time because they drew me closer to the Lord. It was a godly encounter. Can you imagine what Peter felt like when he opened his eyes in that room that was flooded with light and he realized he was living a miracle? A miracle. That doesn't happen very often. And you have to appreciate the humor that it took a blow on Peter's side to get him to awaken out of his deep sleep. The angel smote him, hit him. In other words, said, Peter, wake up. Get up. The end of verse 7, arise quickly, and his chains fell off his hands. Then the angel said to him, gird yourself and tie on your sandals, and so he did. And he said to him, put on your garment and follow me. So he went out and followed him and did not know that it was done by the angel, that it was real, but he thought that he was seeing a vision. This is a great story. But here's the clincher, and this is the first lesson. Herod's plan contained one major flaw in it. He failed to consider what God might do. I'm sure he was very proud and arrogant, thought he had it sewn up. He did it with James. He was going to do it with Peter, just eliminate them all together. But he didn't calculate with God in view, and that was a big mistake. Proverbs 21.30 says, There is no wisdom and no understanding and no counsel against God. 
If I'm going to put that in a loose paraphrase, I would say it's foolishness to be on the side against God. There is no way to win. There's none. God is going to accomplish his will. The second lesson here is that for some unknown reason to us, God chooses to combine divine with human interaction to accomplish his purpose. Now, not always, because we see instances where God shows up on the scene and he just takes care of everything himself. But there are many other times, and this is one of them, where we catch a glimpse of the privilege that God has given to us to interact with him as being divine in order to accomplish his purpose. He alone is capable of doing the extraordinary, but isn't it interesting that he asks us to do the ordinary? Just the ordinary. That same angel that removed the chains from Peter's hands, couldn't he have also put those shoes on Peter's feet? He could have just as easily made it happen, but he told Peter to do it. In order for God's purpose to be carried out, Peter had to obey. That's important for us to learn, that when we have a part in God's plan, we have to obey. Peter had to stoop lower before he stood up. He had to stoop lower. The angel said, arise quickly, gird yourself, put on your sandals, get your coat, follow me. All commands that Peter obeyed. And Peter thought he was seeing a vision. I, he probably wasn't even yet fully out of his deep sleep, still trying to wake up. Look at verse 10. They went out, and when they were past the first and second guard posts, they came to the iron gate that leads to the city, which opened to them of its own accord, and they went out and went down one street, and immediately the angel departed from him. Have you ever known or recognized that when angels appear on the scene, they don't stay very long? They don't hang around. They do a quick work, and they're out of there. And I've wondered, just in my own silly little pea brain, if it's because they don't want attention brought to them. They're there to do a mission. They know what God said. They do it, lickety-split, and then they're gone. Because those that did want attention drawn to them, they were booted out of heaven, led by Lucifer. They're humble beings. They don't call attention to themselves. Verse 11, and when Peter came to himself, he said, now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and has delivered me from the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the Jewish people. So when he had considered this, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered for prayer. And here's our third scene. It's a private home. A familiar place, Mary's house. Mary, who's sister to Barnabas, who's mother to John Mark, who is invested in that early church and whose home was home to many believers who came to pray. It would have been a warm, inviting, gracious environment in which to pray. And what do we see happening in this location? We see passionate prayer taking place behind closed doors where the world wasn't watching but where God saw and knew and verse 12 says there were many gathered together praying I can only imagine how many showed up to pray for Peter there's insight that is given to us in verse 5 as to how they were praying if you look back at verse 5, it says constant prayer was being offered to God on Peter's behalf. Constant prayer means 24-7, round the clock. All those days Peter was in prison, round the clock, those believers were there on their knees passionately praying for Peter. And there are a couple of important things to note here. The term constant prayer 
literally means prayer without ceasing. Prayer without ceasing. It conveys the idea of a stretching out of a muscle to its limits as far as it can go. And if you think of that in terms, in the context of a group setting, it means that they are being stretched out all they can be for someone or something. Stretched out to the max. And in this case, that someone was Peter. But the point is that it was arduous work. It was not easy. It was sacrificial. It was hard. It meant maintaining a continuous attitude of fellowship with God. And I'll come back to that point in just a minute. That term constant prayer also speaks of the intensity of their praying. And the word in the Greek means ektenes. It is E-K-T-E-N-E-S. And literally translated, it means earnestly and fervently. And I was fascinated by the fact that there is a comparative form of this word found in only one other place in the New Testament, and it is where Luke reports the intensity of the Lord's Prayer in Gethsemane. He says in Luke 22 that Jesus, being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, more intensely, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. It's such a thing to think about. I, it, I feel like in this context, we're talking about being on holy ground. There is an intensity of fervency here that is equivalent to that which Jesus experienced in his agony in the Garden of Gethsemane. Now, praying on that scale for someone in need, it's hard for us to fathom. And yet, if you look at the totality of Scripture in the New Testament, that's what God expects to be the norm. This young believing church got the job done because they prayed without ceasing and because they prayed with ectonies, fervency, earnestly, in a way that was comparable to the agony that Jesus felt in that garden. That's amazing. And it seems to us in our humanness to actually be kind of impossible, doesn't it? How? How can we pray this way? We don't lack for passages in the Bible as to how to pray. There's so much there. And yet what we find in Acts chapter 12 is not, it's not a lesson on prayer. It's not a Bible study on prayer. It is a living illustration of the importance of prayer. But how can we pray this way? I think the Lord gave me a little bit of insight that if we can grasp this principle, it will help us to hang on to the possibility that God anticipates for us. Jesus said to his followers in John 16, he said many things there. He said, I have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. But this is one of the things he did say to them. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. That's verse 17 of John 16. And then he goes on a little further there to say, or excuse me, that was verse 7. In verse 13 of that same chapter, Jesus says, And when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, 
and he will tell you things to come. Now think about that. That is God the Father speaking through the Holy Spirit to the mind and heart of the believer. It is one directional communication from him to us via the Spirit. But here's where it becomes two-way. Romans 8, 26. Listen to this. The Spirit also helps in our weaknesses. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. That's two-way communication. God is speaking to us. We're receiving it. We are praying a passionate prayer in our limited weak bodies and minds. We're formulating the best that we can do, but that's okay because the Holy Spirit takes that prayer and with groanings, he intercedes on our behalf before the Father, making it possible for us to pray with ectonies with constant prayer, with a fervency, with an earnestness that in ourselves we don't have, we don't know, we don't understand, and we otherwise would not experience. When was the last time you prayed in like manner? Have you ever prayed that way? It was just two weeks ago, tomorrow, that we said our goodbyes to Dottie Stevenson the gal that taught us so much about prayer over the last 25 years. And she was a true prayer warrior. If you were to come up with just one word to summarize her life, that would be it, prayer. She was all about that prayer. And I remember so many occasions, and if you knew Dottie, you will as well, when we would just be having a casual conversation, and then she would interrupt, and she would say, hold on, honey, the Lord is speaking to me. And then there would be a pause in the conversation. And then she would talk to him. And then she would pause and wait for him to speak to her. And then we would go right back and carry on where we left off, the two of us. But she had a way of making every conversation be about the presence of Jesus. And she made sure that you knew about it. He was the unseen presence in every talk that we had together, and it was quite wonderful. I've never seen it replicated anywhere, but it's a wonderful role model for us to learn from. Going back to Peter, with the angels gone, he stands knocking at Mary's door, a place where he felt very comfortable and safe. And the Holy Spirit inspires Luke to record this incident with just a little bit of humor. We can't help but notice it. Many are inside praying for Peter, and Peter's standing on the doorstep. And Rhoda comes. And she doesn't open the door because Peter's added the fervency of verbal communication to his knocking. Rhoda hears it, and she recognizes Peter, and she runs back to everyone inside and says, Peter's at the door knocking in answer to the prayers. And they told her, you're mad. You're mad. He can't possibly be out there. But he was. And Peter persisted and kept on knocking, and eventually they opened the door and saw him, and they were astonished. And you can imagine how thrilled they would have been. Have you ever been so thrilled about a prayer when God answers something that you've asked for for a while? And you've prayed your heart out, and he's answered and you've recognized that he's answered, when you realize that, go back and tell him thank you. Acknowledge that he's doing that work in your life. But it didn't stop there. And I want to get you guys to your group so you can talk about this yourself and share what the Lord has shown you. You know the rest of the story. 
the not-so-thrilled Herod and those at the palace were in an uproar because Peter was set free. And there was an investigation, and the guards were interrogated, and they were given the death penalty that Peter would have gotten had he stayed in that prison. And Herod, desiring to put the matter behind him, turns his back on Jerusalem and moves to Caesarea, where he wants to start over. And it's interesting that it says he abode in Caesarea. And it literally means to rub away, to erase from your mind, and to begin again anew. But he didn't, because he was ever the politician, ever wanting to court the favor of the people. And he made a big mistake again. He calculated without God in view. And he crossed a line. And he received the accolades and the applause of men. And Josephus says of that, that when Herod came in wearing a silver garment, he came in at the right moment when the sun's rays would fall upon it, and it shone out in such a resplendent way as to spread a horror over those that looked intently upon him. And very shortly, they cried out, he's a god, he's a god. And then he was eaten by worms and took five days to die. And that was the end of Herod. And I wondered if it was the same angel that smote Peter that also smote Herod. We're not told whether that's the case or not. But Herod believed that he had the upper hand against God. God revealed that he was in control and had the last word. And the last scene leads us to God's perfect Place, which is heaven's home, and it is from there that he is on the throne. He is in control of our times and his purposes. And verse 24 says that the word of God grew and multiplied, and that is God's purpose, that wherever he takes his word, it will grow and it will multiply. The point of our story all comes down to God's purpose and his pleasure go hand in hand. There is no purpose fulfilled apart from that passionate plea. He does the extraordinary. We do the ordinary. And together, he allows us with him to accomplish his purpose for his church. We may not have an angel, but we have the Holy Spirit saying essentially the same thing to us. Arise quickly, put on your garments, put on that spiritual armor that we see in Ephesians 6. Pray without ceasing, follow me. That's what he would say to us tonight. If you don't already pray with your Christian sisters, start doing it now. Start with just a few in your discussion group. Or get together with a few at your workplace, in your neighborhood, where it's convenient for you. We have multiple opportunities here at the church on Wednesday, on Sunday. You can find those opportunities in your bulletin, but make it a matter of determined purpose to get together with others and pray. Shake your world up. You will find answers coming your way if you will do that. In a PS to what I shared earlier to you about Saeed Abendini, three years in that prison in Iran, just yesterday, his wife Nagme was granted a private meeting with President Barack Obama. As he, yes, go ahead and applaud. That is indeed an answer to all the prayer that has gone up for this family. But she was allowed to come in and sit down. She brought her two young children with her, and she shared with Kathy Laurie just this morning that when she initially walked into that room to meet President Obama, he seemed to have a guard up. He seemed to be defensive. And she anticipated that. So she had prayed about how to approach him. And what she did as she sat down opposite his desk is she said, 
President Obama, I love you in Christ, and I pray for your presidency. And she shared the gospel of Christ with him. Yes. And she told him she wants her husband home. And he looked at her across the desk, and he said, thank you. I need those prayers. And he took her hands in his and held them for nearly the entire 10 minutes that she was sitting there speaking with him. And he assured her that he would do everything in his power to see that her husband is set free. And her little son chimed in and said, Mr. President, could you bring my daddy home by my birthday? And he said, when's your birthday? And her son said, March 17th. So he looked at her son and he said, I promise you, I will do everything within my power as the President of the United States to try to get your daddy home by March 17th. So we're going to be watching and we're going to be praying. The story is not over. And we're going to pray for them right now as we close. Father, we thank you tonight for your word that's alive. It's in our hearts. It's on our minds. It's written on that fleshly human tablet. And we, tonight, as a united body of Christ, come together to lift to you the Abedini family. We pray for Sahid, who has endured so much over three years, who is so frail in health and being treated just so harshly, it's difficult to even put into words. But we remember from Nagme's visit with us just this last year that his will, her husband's will, is to accomplish yours. And he is sharing that gospel in that prison. So for as long as you have him there, we pray that he would be unfettered in the spoken word of sharing your message of salvation. But we do pray together collectively, Lord, that when it is your time, that you would break those chains that you would open that prison door and that you would let him walk out, a free man, home to his family. And God, we pray that it would even be by March 17th. And then, Lord, we pray that you would do the work in us that you want to do in accordance with your will. We will keep asking, we will keep seeking, and we will keep knocking. In Jesus' precious name, amen.